So we were at Nerd NYC, and our good friend, as we started to tell, whipped out this game, and it had a really cute panda on the cover, a precocious panda. It is called Takenoko, and I, straight off the bat, I'm going to say that this is an equivalent game in terms of the way you can use it as a person who owns games and needs to present games for other people you know to play as Zuloretto. Mm -hmm. well, similar, and it's not just because it has animals. No, but yeah, similar level of complexity, mm. similar level of how difficult it is to teach, how quick it is to play, how easy it is to socialize while playing. Also, uh, it, you know, the, while the theme is animals, and that, but that's not has anything to do with their similarity. But what is similar in the theme is the theme is accessible and friendly, right? Which does matter if you got a new player, right? Yes, I mean, look if at you R2 bust out something like you know St. Petersburg. It's like okay, it's got this theme with old European dudes all over it. That's not enticing to someone who's never played a yeah, game. Yeah, I was gonna before. say go to go to some of our friends and be like, you want to play a game that simulates the uh, plantation crop trade in Puerto Rico, right? Or Panda game. Right, if you take the exact same game and you put zombies on it, suddenly people want to play because they're shallow and don't... Wow, really you could just reskin Takenoko as a zombie game. Yeah, why not? Pretty trivially. You could reskin any game as any game, trivially. Uh, nah, sometimes what the game, metaphor what breaks game down. What game can't I reskin? Can't reskin. All right. Try to reskin Puerto Rico All right. as Tic-Tac-Toe. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> there's not enough things in Tic Tac Toe. Exactly. Tic Tac Toe is not really a theme. I chose the stupid example. Th that's not it. That, th that's Tic Tac Toe isn't really a theme. It's more of a game, right? You need to pick a All theme. All right, so theme it like Tic Tac Toe. Theme it like Tic Tac Toe? Okay, so there would just be. I'd need more than X's and O's, though. I'd have to, like, you know, make, like, X's with an O around them. And, you know, so See, my, my would point be an is o, simply and that a point would be for an a X. game like Puerto Rico, the theme of the game is pretty deeply tied to the metaphor of the mechanics. Mm -hmm. Like, the, the, the it is a metaphor for the mechanics, in a sense. Well, and yeah, in some games, that's more or less tied, right? And when it is really closely tied, it's pretty awesome, right? When they're poorly well, like tied... Like, when a Dominion card, the thing it does makes sense, considering what it is... That's always awesome. But when it doesn't make sense, it literally just confuses players and causes you to cock up rules. Yeah, when it's like militia, make the other guy discard two cards. It's like, oh, I get it. The militia attacks the other guy's hand. It makes sense, right? But when it's like chapel, trash, you know, zero to four cards, it's like, what does chapel have to do I'm with I'm confessing trashing? my sins and getting rid of them, lightening my load. I guess, but that's stretching it, you see. That's not and that much of a stretch. It's, not, it's, still, it's, it's more of a stretch. Why would the militia attack my hand instead of my town? It, it, you don't have a town, but it, you, oh, you see how it's more of a stretch. Yeah, I do. I have all these provinces. Right, okay, he's the perfect one that's not a stretch. I have an estate. Why right. didn't they attack that? The moat. You know, defends against attacks. Perfect metaphor, right? It's a moat. It's a defensive structure. It defends against anything because it's a moat. Perfect. But how how does it defend against the witches? They fly. It just does. They don't like getting wet. But they fly. They, they don't, don't like have getting to wet. get wet. But if you have a moat, you can splash them. <laughs> so it should be moat and splasher. <laughs> no, you're the splasher. <laughs> <laughs> but then how am I going to manage my estate? I have a shit ton it's of them. It's inside the castle. It's protected by the moat. Do you know how many estates I have? Three. <laughs> so Takenoko is a pretty simple game. The story of the game is actually pretty cute, too. You've got this precocious panda, Takenoko, and you might think, wait a minute, do these guys confuse China and Japan? Because pandas are from China, and Takenoko is a Japanese name. Mm. That is what everyone who came up to the table to see what we were playing said when we told them what the game was called. Yep. <laughs> but no, the story is the emperor of China in a show of good faith, gives the Emperor of Japan, as a gift, a precocious panda. Oh, uh, but it was a trap gift. The Emperor of Japan doesn't know what to do, so he gives it to the poor gardener. And the gardener doesn't know what to do, and the gar there's a little miniature of a panda, and there's a miniature of the gardener. The gardener has this look on her face like, what the fuck am I going to do with this panda? <laughs> I don't know what the fuck I would do with a panda. Play with it and feed it bamboo, apparently. Where would I get enough bamboo for the panda? Apparently it grows pretty easily. Where am I going to grow it? In your luscious Japanese garden. Yeah, you know how much freaking bamboo you need to feed a so panda? So anyway, the metaphor of this game actually does not link too closely to the reality of the game mechanics. The game is a pretty abstract game of sort of 
pattern matching territory control with card objectives, kind of like uh, Ticket to Ride. But you don't really control territories so much as try to construct a territory that will match while other people are trying to match on similar things. You can have momentary control by putting things on territories that augment them. Yeah, it's like there's a shared space, right? So in Ticket to Ride, it's like these are your trains, these are someone else's trains, and you're trying to get your trains to meet your goals. In this game, there's a shared space, and everyone can modify that space in different ways, and you're trying to get the shared space to match your goals, and everyone has goals, so you might inadvertently help it match someone else's goal. You might, you know... Someone else might do something that makes it not match your goal anymore and make it more difficult for you to make the space match your goal. Yep. So you modify the shared space and you get cards and you need the space to go in line with what your cards say. And then you can play the cards to get points. So I should back up. You can't really control the territory so much as you can control access to the territory at a given time. Uh, there's actually, for such a simple game to learn, there's a surprising number of mechanics when I think about trying to mention them all here. Basically, the pa there's three ways to get victory points, and you get them from these cards. One deck of cards has a series of configurations of colored tiles that can, that can basically constitute the board. There's pink ones and yellow ones and green ones. I think it's only three colors. Yeah, I think so, too. So, if the if there's like... Two pinks in a row, or three in a row, or three in a circle, and that's on the board. At any time on your turn, you can reveal that, yes, I have that pattern. I get that many victory points, however many are on the card. All right, but it's really easy to set these up because just the tiles just have to be on the board. So you just choose the action for place tiles on the board, and you really only need, like, a few tiles. So you can, if you choose that action enough, it's easy to score on these cards very, you know, quickly. But these cards aren't worth very many points. They're worth like two, three, four points based on their difficulty. But if you get enough of them quickly enough, you could end the game because playing a number of cards is the game ending condition. So if you can get seven of these before other people have a chance to score big point cards, you can win. So well, it, is a, it is a good strategy. So here, so he, the way to win the game is there, when a player has revealed seven matching victory point cards that they have actually done, they reveal them, they've got them out. The game will end, every other player gets one final turn. You can only reveal cards on your turn, but if you have more than seven revealed, that's okay. So say Scott reveals the seventh one and immediately ends the game. The game is in I get a two-point bonus for being the guy who to first reveal a and seven. And then we all get to take our turns. Say I already had six revealed, and I have five more cards in my hand, which is the hand limit, that actually have matched, but I had not revealed yet because I didn't want to end the game. On my turn, I can reveal all of them. Yeah, you have a hand limit. I now what? have 11 The, the hand limit cards. is five, so you can have five cards in your hand, have six on the table, and then if you can somehow manage to get all five of those to, to be scored at once, you just play them all at once. So my I won this game, like, handily. And the way I did it was pretty simple. I looked at the board and figured out how to get as many of these cards as possible. I didn't care how many points they were worth. I just wanted to match, match, match. And I did that, and then I held them all in my hand. I only revealed, like, one or two at a time, so I was on par with everyone else. But then one turn, every card in my hand was also matched, and I could just end the game. So I just dropped all my cards, and no one was even close to me. Yeah, I mean, I tried to get more of those cards, but there's also this die factor, right? So at the beginning of your turn, you roll a die, sort of like Settlers, and that die determines the weather, and the weather pretty strongly influences your turn. If you roll, I think, the rain, well, you the, can, the, well, the wind, the if you roll the wind, you can do the same action well, no, twice. No, 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 let's back up a little bit. So that basically, on your turn is simple. You take, you roll the die, and get a bonus action, and then you take any two actions. You have a list of actions like uh, plant, play some tiles on the board, or draw a card, any one you like, or move the panda, or move the farmer. And then the die determines what your third special action is. And they range from your two actions can be the same action, or get a third action, or Those are do whatever the, the fuck ones, you want, right? or get one of these uh, modifiers to tiles that I don't care about. Exactly. If you roll the one that gives you three actions and the one that lets you double up on actions, or the, the one that lets you choose, and then you can choose. Or the rain. The rain was really good. The rain is okay. 
But a lot of these other ones kind of suck, depending, you know, I'm sure somebody says, oh, no, if you roll those, here's what you do, right? But, you know, it's like I'm already going in a particular direction. You know, I don't know what my future roles are going to be. So if one person rolls, let's say theoretically, the get three actions thing, they're probably gonna win if someone keeps. No, a- because you can't take the same action twice, and there's a big but diminishing you, you, return. But you also have to roll the one. The thing is, if you get three actions, you can always use that third action to draw a card and still get two actions to Unless try to fulfill the cards. Unless your hand is full of things that you can't lay down. But if you're using two act, the other two actions to fulfill the cards, you can lay them down. Ah, but you're also he- helping everyone else out, and actually, you're, but I you found- don't know if you're helping anyone else out. You could be hurting other people. I you found- don't know. Yeah, and you know what? The way I won is I only did things that other players couldn't fuck with and that I could not help other players with. Mm. I got one, because, you know, there's three decks of the cards with these quests. One of them is basically configuration of the board. One of them is configuration of growth of bamboo on a particular tile, which is much more difficult to pull off. And then one of them is some combination of bamboo that Takenoko has eaten. No one else was going for that, so I just went for that like 100%. And I went for that 100% also. So how come I had five cards with those points on them, and you had, what, one? Because you, I kept rolling the thing that gives me the stupid modifier tokens, and you often rolled the wind thingy that let you choose the take card action twice. I only rolled wind once in the game. I was not able to draw enough of those cards, even though I wanted to. See, if you have those modifiers, you really should be going for the high point cards instead of the panda cards. I also went for the high point cards, but the thing is you can't play the modifiers unless it's on an empty tile, completely empty. So I had these modifiers I couldn't use for anything. They were completely useless. So basically other people were getting bonuses on their turn by the luck of the die. The game and is I was a little not. random yeah. in that regard. Anyway, and it's not perfect. It's, le- it's slightly less random than Settlers, but it's similar in its randomness to Settlers in that you're playing a game where you make a bunch of decisions, but every turn you roll a die that determines something. For it your determines third. a third action. Right. But the mechanics are, there's a lot of like interesting things going on to make the game not nearly as simple to play optimally as, say, Zularetto. Mm. For one, there's the game of no- the odds of what different cards of people drawn or will they draw and will I give someone else victory points and is someone else close to ending the game and all that stuff. There's also this mechanic of if you move the panda, he'll then eat bamboo from wherever he ends up. If you move the farmer, then all the tiles of the same color as where he is that are adjacent to him, the bamboo grows up and there's these cool pieces of stacking bamboo like on the board, like these big stacks. But both of them the can only move. The pieces in this game are really awesome. In a straight line, which doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal, but because of the way the board grows, it actually is a huge deal. Because in order to go for a particular strategy, like I wanted one particular spot to grow bamboo, and it was incredibly obvious this is what I wanted to happen because it was so diff. I had to take multiple actions to set it up to grow over there, meaning everyone knew I really wanted it to grow and just totally dicked me on it. Yeah, it's like I sort of tried to pay attention to that. It was the first time, but it's like I knew that someone wanted to put something somewhere, and I was like, move the farmer to that spot. That way he can't, it can't move it in a straight line to the spot he wants to move it to, and it won't be what he wants because he made it obvious to what he wants. Yep. And that's what happened. Does hurt, killing the other guy, making him lose an action or lose points, taking him out of the game. Whereas whenever I was my turn, the panda and the farmer always happened to be in just the right spot for me uh, to move them where <laughs> I wanted to move them. But I couldn't get enough cards to draw, so I only could score you know, yep. so many points. Well, see, I don't know if it mattered, but basically that spot I was going for was the only card I ever held that I didn't play. And I knew I wasn't going to get it. So whenever I had an extra action that I could not do anything useful with, what I did is go for making that grow to convince everyone, at least I was hoping, to think I really needed that and waste their actions stopping me from achieving whatever it was they thought I was trying yeah, to achieve. Yeah, that's another thing. Is I never did an action to screw anyone that was not also an action to benefit me. But you could, by bluffing, you know, and depending on how many cards you've played already, you know, to convince people that, like, you're ahead or whatever, convince people to spend actions trying to hurt you, and maybe they will hurt you or hurt your bluff or who knows what. Thus, actually helping you by by hurting them, but because they waste their actions. Now that part is interesting because this game mechanically would be 
incredibly simple, like baby's first ticket to ride. But there's just enough mechanics interleaved with each other to actually give a surprising amount of strategic depth despite the randomness. And for skilled players playing this game, it'll actually turn into a Twilight Struggle anticipation and card counting game. Like, it really will become a game of bluffing and second guessing. Right, because it's like, Rim, I know in his hand he has the hex cards, right? Yes, so, three. I have three of them. And I can see on the board, I know what the possible hex cards are. It's usually three in a cook or three in a row and or four in a blob. So where I will make sure I will not draw any hex cards. His hand has a limit on it. He can't play them unless he scores them. I'm going to choose the hex action. I'm going to put hexes down that I need of the right color to eat the panda or whatever, but I'm going to put them in spots that make it impossible for any of those hex cards to score. Now what's Rim going to do with his handful of cards he can't score? He's pretty much done. But maybe I was bluffing on that because I have three hex cards in my hand that are worthless, and I have two high-scoring ones that you're ignoring now. Maybe, but I have four high-scoring ones and now I think I can score on four of mine, and you'll only score on well, two. Well, maybe, but I just got really lucky in one anyway. <laughs> it's possible. Now, I, I guess my point is just that the game is more complex than you might think on the first play, in that it'll have plenty of staying power, even for skilled players, but it is not the main event. It's like Zularetto. It's fun to play, but I would play it as the warm-up before I played Puerto Rico or Tigris and Euphrates. It's not... The brain feel is not that strong. No. It does not engage the brain but too I think, deeply. But what's great about it, right, is that it has a lot more brain feel than, you know, uh, your typical warm-up game. Like spotted. But it only takes, like, 30 minutes. This game is fast. This game really is faster fa than Zularetto. It's, yeah, it's way faster than Zularetto or Settlers and just as, you know, has just as much going on. But it's over like that which is totally awesome in terms of, you know, overall brain power. It's not the highest on the charts, but in terms of brain power to time it takes to play an entire game, the ratio may be the highest I've ever played, ever. Mm, Can you that's, think? that's a tough one. I have to think on that. We could do a whole show like, on... Like, what game has more brain feel per minute? Ooh. Right? It's like, yeah, sure, Eclipse is awesome, but it takes forever, right? It, yeah. There's plenty of other war games. They also take forever. What game has, you know, and this is not as, it doesn't have as much as Puerto Rico, but it Battle has, Line it has, has as much as Settlers. Battle but, Line has a pretty intense brain feel and is over pretty quickly, but I don't think it's quite on the ratio of this game. No, I don't think so either. I'll have to think on that. I feel like there's a show there, something about what what we mean by brain feel, because that's a term that me and Scott have been using lately, talking about games. You've been using it for the last five minutes. No, I've, I've been using it for a few weeks now. It, I've been hearing it off and on. No one else uses that term talking about board games. <laughs> I feel like we might need to clarify what we mean by that. Pretty sure someone else has uh, Maybe, used but it. I, think, I think we could do a show on something like that. But anyway, Takenoko is equivalent to Ticket to Ride or Zularetto in terms of, hey, here's a pretty easy to teach game that we can play while we socialize, as opposed to the silent game of Puerto Rico. But it's not a completely worthless game that, you know, that has no intellectual component whatsoever. And simultaneously is not a light game like Spot It, which while Spot It is very light mechanically, it wears the brain out, for one, because of the type of test it is, and two, you can't actually socialize while playing Spot It. This game, this game lets is also you short, so you can socialize and then bail quickly, as opposed to be, you know, even if it's a socializable game, you won't be evicted from the party because the game's over quickly and you're back partying. Exactly. Again. So I'm probably going to buy it. Why wouldn't you? Well, if you bought it, I would not. Why would you not? Uh, because I don't want to. Well, then I won't buy it. So now we can't play it. Okay. Uh, uh, say. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brand OK for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. <laughs>